I am not Stephen Davey. He's a bit under the weather, and he asked me uh, late at yesterday afternoon if uh, I could fill in for him. And here's the reason why, the rationale. Because I am slated, originally slated, to be the last speaker in the summer series. And so Stephen asked me, well, why don't you move up? And so um, I am uh, going to begin the summer series today. Uh, the summer series uh, for 2023 is entire, entitled Selections from an Inspired Hymnal. And this series will involve seven sermons on seven different psalms from seven different speakers from our own ministries here at the Shepherd's Church and in uh, Shepherd's Theological Seminary. And as I said, I was originally scheduled to be the last of the speakers, but now I've moved up to the lead-off position. So here I am today. So let's start the summer series of 2023 with prayer. Let's pray together. Father, how thankful we are for your word that is proclaimed so faithfully here every week. And it is truly a joy for us to be part of this church. Thank you for raising it up. Thank you uh, for allowing us to be part of this church. And Father, as we begin our summer series, I pray that uh, the selections from Psalms uh, will challenge us, inspire us, motivate us for your glory. I pray particularly that you will help me to be clear this morning and that each one of those who will be listening will be by the power of the Holy Spirit inspired and uh, uh, illumined so that we can understand your word and as we leave, we'll be able to do it. Help us to obey you, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I love to uh, read personal letters. I love to read diaries and accounts written particularly by historic figures, historic people. I want to get behind the event and see what they were thinking and what they thought and why they did what they did. So I, I love uh, reading the thoughts and memoirs of people like President uh, George Washington, uh, Abraham Lincoln. Um, I really love uh, Harry Truman and also Ronald Reagan. And so I love to read their memoirs and their papers. Uh, also, generals. I love military history, so I've read the memoirs of Grant. Uh, I've read a lot about Robert E. Lee um, in World War II, uh, Eisenhower, trying to understand what he was thinking, especially um, as he mounted uh, the, uh, the offensive uh, into uh, Europe um, and the Allies and getting that all together. I love uh, General Patton, George Patton. Uh, he was my favorite general. Um, I love uh, a little more uh, recent from the Gulf War, Generals Norman Schwarzkopf and Colin Powell. So I've read their, um, I've read their memoirs to see what, what they're thinking. Um, I love sports. I love athletes, coaches. Uh, my favorite coach is John Wooden uh, from UCLA. And then... Uh, I love to, to figure out uh, what quarterbacks are thinking, like Brett Favre, well, he didn't think at all. He just, you know, threw the ball all over the place. But Brett Favre, Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, I love trying to understand what they were thinking as they were leading. The historical event around which all of history revolves is the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And all four Gospels, they record the event, and they record the events surrounding, uh, surrounding the crucifixion. But today's text in Psalm 22, it looks at the thoughts of Christ during the indescribably agonizing event of the crucifixion. We get behind the event of the cross to see what Jesus was thinking. Now you might be saying, wow, that, how do we know that? Well, I'm going to develop that this morning because, you see, I think uh, Psalm 22, we can see Jesus' thoughts while he was on the cross. So turn in your Bible or your mobile device to Psalm 22. And as you're turning there, uh, there was a time in David's life when he was in distress. He cried out to God. He felt abandoned, and we see that in Psalm 22. This involved a very real event for David, Psalm 22. However, this psalm was directly quoted seven times in the New Testament, and eight times it was alluded to in the New Testament, and every time there's a reference to Jesus Christ. Most scholars agree that Psalm 22 goes beyond David. 
it is a double fulfillment. In a sense, the limited fulfillment is related to what was happening to David. And the long-term fulfillment is related to the future, referring to Christ. So for our study this morning, we're going to focus on Psalm 22 and the Messiah on the cross. And it's, it's really interesting to note that David wrote this psalm nearly 1,000 years before the crucifixion of Christ. And uh, during David's time, no one had ever even heard of crucifixion. You see, you might recall, Jews put criminals to death by stoning them. In fact, crucifixion was invented by the Persians around 500 B.C. That would be 500 years after David, 500 years before Christ. And crucifixion was quite possibly the most painful death ever invented by mankind. In fact, the English language derives this word excruciating from the word crucifixion. You can even see it when you look at it. And it acknowledges this word excruciating, crucifixion, acknowledges that it's a form of slow, painful suffering. Crucifixion was something that never occurred in David's lifetime. It didn't exist. And yet he described it with explicit detail since he was writing under the supernatural leading of the Holy Spirit. So this morning as we look at Psalm 22, we will see, we're going to see two perspectives of the Savior. Two perspectives of the Savior. And both perspectives will answer the question, what was Jesus thinking while he was on the cross? So verses 1 through 21 is the first perspective, the suffering Savior. And verses 22 through 31 is the second perspective, the triumphant Savior. And interesting, as you look at the, the different tenses in Hebrew, and we see it even in English, verses 1 through 21, a lot of present tense verbs, what's going on. And then in verses 22 through 31, a lot of future tense verbs, what looking forward to in the future. Remember I said both sections answer, what was Jesus thinking? Well, we do know um, on the actual day of the crucifixion, Good Friday, we know uh, from 9 a.m. when it started till noon, we know that Jesus was thinking some things because he's actually speaking. Um, in uh, uh, one, one time he refers to the women who were weeping after him. He said, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. And then also we see what, for the soldiers who drove the nails through the hands and the feet of Jesus, he said to the Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. So he was thinking about soldiers. He was thinking about the dying thief when he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And then he was also thinking of his mother when he entrusted his mother to John and said so, uh, dear woman, here is your son. And then to John he said, uh, here is your mother. And so he was thinking about those things, and we see that from 9 a.m. till noon. But from noon until 3 p.m., it changed. Great darkness fell upon the planet that day, and it lasted from noon till 3 in the afternoon. And we, we wonder, what was he thinking then? Well, if you look at his words in the gospel account, you know he, was, he spoke, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was thinking about that. That's a quote from Psalm 22, verse 1. We also know when he said, I'm thirsty, in John 19, 28, that's an allusion to Psalm 22, 15, describing where he says, my tongue sticks to my jaws. And then the very last verse of Psalm 22, uh, those who are scholars in Hebrew would say it's a hint of the very words Jesus spoke at the end when he said in John 19.30, it is finished. We see from he, Psalm 22, verse 31, he has done it. There's a similarity in concept in Hebrew. 
And so we see that what Jesus was thinking from noon until three on the cross, he's thinking through Psalm 22. Further evidence of this we see in, for example, look at verse 18. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. That particular prophecy is recorded in all four of the gospel accounts on Good Friday. That they were, the soldiers were at the, at the foot of the cross gambling with uh, the reward for the one who would win the gambling, the garments of Christ. And so Jesus is watching the fulfillment of Psalm 22's prophecy while he is on the cross. So he's thinking about Psalm 22. He is seeing it actually fulfilled right there in the event as he was suffering on the cross. As I said, there's two perspectives of the Savior here in Psalm 22. Verses 1 through 21, we see the first perspective, the suffering Savior. What was he thinking? What was he thinking at this time? Well, he's thinking about the pain and the despair of that moment. Take a look once again at verses 1 and 2. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh, my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. This is reflecting the intense spiritual suffering Jesus was going through on the cross. The spiritual suffering involved the separation from the Father. First, for the first time, God the Son did not have fellowship with the Father. It's as if God the Father turns his back upon God the Son. Why? Why does he do that? Because we see the answer in verse 3. It says, you are holy. The Father witnessing the Son, the Son taking upon himself the sins of the world. And it's in this moment of separation, this moment of silence from God the Father, was the most intense of the sufferings that Jesus went through, the, the spiritual suffering. And so we see him in the midst of his despair. He's crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he shifts. There's a swing from those words of despair, verses 3 through 5. We see some hope. We see some hope. Verse 3, yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. And so we see this intense, incredible, indescribable spiritual suffering of Jesus, verses 1 and 2. Then we see verses 3 through 4, some hope. He prays out to the Father, and he recognizes in that moment that there is hope in the Father. And so we see in the next few verses, there's like swinging back and forth from the despair of verses 1 and 2 to the hope, verses 3 through 5. And then he returns to the despair in verses 6 through 8. I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Verses 6 through 8, we see the slurs of men, the scorn heaped upon Jesus. In fact, verse 8, we see quoted in Matthew 27, 43. Scorn, ridicule, mockery of Jesus. And so the spiritual suffering, verses 1 and 2, now in verses 6 through 8, we see the emotional 
suffering, the emotional suffering of Jesus. Remember I said it, it swings back and forth. Verses 6 through 8, the slurs of men, the mockery of men. Then it comes and swings back to verses 9 through 11. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth. And from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. So from the slurs of men, then we see this prayer and this hope in verses 9 through 11. So this first perspective of the suffering Savior, we see the spiritual suffering of God the Son. We see the emotional suffering that he went through as scorn and mockery was heaped upon him, ridicule. And then the physical suffering, the physical suffering that we see in verses 12 through 18. Verse 12 says, Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. Scholars uh, see a, some kind of a hint here, a possible demonic activity. The demons around, swirling around at that very moment of Christ's crucifixion. And here's where they get it from. This word, uh, many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan. Bashan was known as a region in this part of the world with very lush and wonderful kind of meadows and pasture lands. The problem were the wild bulls who were vicious. As you know, bulls are fearsome. Well, when they're wild, not domesticated, it was, it was overwhelming. And so uh, this seems to be a, a metaphor for the wildness of the demonic forces who were like a ravening and roaring lion. We see that uh, reference in the New Testament by uh, Peter, uh, First Peter, talking about Satan as a roaring lion. And so begins this next explanation of the physical sufferings of Christ, spiritual, emotional, and now verses 13 through 18, the physical, the physical suffering. As we look at the physical suffering of Christ, I've done a lot of study on crucifixion and what it means and what it meant in that day. It would begin with scourging, scourging, whipping. It would, uh, the scourging would lead to circulatory shock and often itself, it was so violent and so ferocious, the scourging often would lead to the cause of death itself, before even the cross, through the loss of blood, the loss of bodily fluid, the scourging. And the reason for the scourging was not just uh, for, for uh, that kind of pain, but to enhance the pain of crucifixion. For you see with your back an open wound, and then you'd be placed on the cross made of rough, wood and your back up against the cross and as you would struggle for breath you you would start to sag you would sag under the weight of your own body and then you would push up on the pedestal upon which your feet rested and as you slid up that rough hewn wood with your open wounds in your back incredible pain and then gradually you would just start falling back further it was said there's, there was no comfortable position on a cross, constantly lifting up to struggle for breath and then sagging down. That's why the scourging. That's why that incredible pain. And then the uh, idea of this actual cause of death. What was the cause of death? When I was a little boy and uh, would see paintings of Jesus on the cross, I would say, how did he die? Would, would nails into his hands, into his feet, is that how it would kill him? 
So in my study, I came across the 21st century, just recently, in the last 15 years, uh, a medical experiment with some volunteers that they placed on, uh, in similar fashion on a metal stake with a cross piece. And they were trying to determine medically what was going on in the cross. So they found that after about 15 to 20 minutes of hanging on the cross, these people involved in the in the experiment, their heart, they were, they were monitoring their heart, their heart began to race. And the heart would beat up to 172 beats a minute. The legs became severely cramped. Arms were cramped. Air intake was diminishing. Stress was increasing. And if they let it continue, hypoxia would result, which is when respiration decreases, oxygen levels are reduced in the blood, and carbon dioxide levels build up, it could lead to suffocation. And then fluid would start to build around the pericardial membrane. And the pericardial effusion was what they call that. That's when they thrust the spear into the side of Jesus. And out came, <clears throat> came his blood mingled with water. That was the pericardial effusion. So... What actually was the cause of death at crucifixion? <clears throat> well, the shock, just of all the fluid loss <clears throat> and trauma, ruptured heart, aneurysm, the heart racing, <clears throat> suffocation, hypoxia, asphyxiation, weight on the diaphragm <clears throat> would start to, to cause you to asphyxiate. And then the pain. <clears throat> the total shutdown of all bodily fluids. And so, it was a terrible, terrible way to die. One other thing. <clears throat> the shoulders would be placed at a strange angle, weight, and ultimately, usually would dislocate early in the process. And so this painful death, excruciating, horrific, slow, agonizing death. Well, let's take a look at this description now in Psalm 30, uh, 22. Look at verse 13. They open wide their mouths. They're mocking him. Verse 14, I'm poured out like water. It's profuse perspiration. All my bones out of joint. Remember I said the shoulders would frequently dislocate. My heart, like wax, it's like beating so fast, it's melting within my breast. My strength dried up. There's, you, you would lose all your ability, your strength, uh, by just the sheer gravitational pull on your body, losing your strength. My tongue sticks to my jaws. That, that's the, the, the incredible thirst and then verse 16, dogs encompass me, a company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. There, reference to the nails in his hands and feet. And then he's, verse 17, I can count all my bones hanging on the cross, uh, looking down and seeing your uh, ribcage and bones there. And it then continues, they stare and gloat over me. One other thing I didn't mention about crucifixion, to maximize the sense of humiliation to the one being crucified and to the family members and to the friends, you would be crucified with no clothing. You would be naked for the world to see in your humiliation and your shame. And so... The spiritual suffering of our Savior, the silence of God, the turning away from God the Father, the emotional suffering, scorn and slurs cast upon a mockery, a public shame of nakedness, the physical 
suffering that we just talked about. But as I said, Jesus would go back and forth on the cross. Psalm 22, verses 1 and 2, the the spiritual suffering. Verses 3 through 5, the hope. Verses 6 through 8, the slurs of men. Verses 9 through 11, the prayer and hope. The suffering of crucifixion, 13 through 18, followed by the prayer, verses 19 through 21. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. So we see Jesus on the cross thinking through these verses, thinking through saying, I am now fulfilling this prophecy as the suffering Savior. The second perspective. There's a shift in Hebrew verbs to the future tense. We see it in our English. Take a look at verse 22, the beginning of this shift. I will tell of your name. There's a future Future consideration, the triumphant Savior. Here, the triumphant Savior, he's thinking about the future, which brings him a sense of victory and triumph. Specifically, what in the future is he thinking about on the cross? Verse 22, I will tell of your name to my brothers. I believe that's a reference to Israel. In the midst of the congregation, I'll praise you. Verse 23, You who fear the Lord, praise him, all you offspring of Jacob. Now we start seeing a little more specific talking about Israel. And then he just gets very specific. End of verse 23. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. So we know that Jesus is recounting, thinking through Psalm 22. He's thinking about Israel. But it continues. We see in Verse 27, all the ends of the earth shall remember. Turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. So Jesus thinking about Israel. Now starts thinking and he's meditating on the cross. Thinking about the Gentiles and nations. That's messianic thinking about the, the rule of Jesus Christ, the thousand-year reign of Christ. He's thinking about that. Israel, Gentiles. Then it continues. It says, Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. Jesus was thinking about people yet unborn. I believe he was thinking about you. 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 Israel, the Gentiles, yes, I think he was thinking about you. You and I were included in Jesus' thoughts on the cross Specifically, though, the people he's thinking of on the cross in verse 23. You who fear the Lord. Verse 25. Those who fear him. Verse 26. Those who seek him. Verse 27. Those of the ends of the earth shall remember, turn to the Lord. Verse 27 also. Worship. Before him. Verse 29, those who bow before him shall bow. You see, those are the ones he's thinking of. He's thinking of those who have understood what he was doing on the cross. He was thinking about us. And then the way it ends, as I said earlier, commentators see this, he has done it. It's a hint in Hebrew of the words that Jesus spoke in John 19, verse 30. 
when he said, Tetelestai, it is finished. The payment for sin was finished. The idea here is that Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross the payment for sinners. For those who place their trust in him, he is sufficient in paying for the penalty that should be falling upon them. J. Vernon McGee, the famous preacher, you can hear him on the radio still to this day, he called Psalm 22 an x-ray of the cross. And that's true. It is an x-ray of the cross. But I think it's also a window into hell. A window into hell. When we see verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what people in hell will say forever and forever and forever. It's not a party. Not a great time. Not a bunch of your pals having one big eternal cake party. You'll sense that you've been forsaken by God for all eternity and you will be alone in torment. And so, as we consider what Jesus was thinking of, he was thinking of you. And so, the question today is, as he's thinking of you on the cross, what do you think of him and what he did on the cross? Are you like the soldiers taking dice and throwing the dice, gambling at the foot of the cross? Or do you recognize that at that cross is the payment for your sins and is the payment for your eternal salvation because of what Jesus did on the cross and so the question today is not simply the first perspective of the suffering Savior or the second perspective of the triumphant Savior. The perspective today really is, what do you think? How do you look at the cross? What do you see when you read this account? How have you responded? Fear the Lord, seek Him, remember Him, turn to Him, worship Him, bow down to Him. It's all the same way of saying, trust Jesus Christ as your Savior from your sin. 